good afternoon to all respected and dear participants first of all i must welcome you all to this academic platform uh, today i really feel blessed to welcome our uh, professor shantik kumar tiwari sir uh, to this webinar organized by bengal law college shanti niketan i have heard many a time from his direct student that to be in his class suggests something anarchy they are all keenly expecting to attend the class so this is our turn today is our turn and equal with equal intensity so we are waiting for this session so without any delay i would like to request our first lecture to initiate the session i again welcome you sir we really feel blessed by your august presence thank you ma'am for your introductory words now i'll request uh, today's honorable resource person professor dr sanjeev kumar tiwari sir uh, to enlighten the audience of this national webinar on the topic fundamental rights paradox during covid-19 crisis and relevancy of legal pragmatism over to you sir thank you anidita uh, at the very outset i like to thank the organizing committee especially anandita and uh, debojyoti for uh, inviting me to this webinar and giving me this opportunity of sharing my views on a very very relevant topic on covid-19 so as you can gather from the topic the central theme of the topic is covid-19 of course but it will be discussed in the legal pragmatism perspective and in the perspective of fundamental rights paradoxes so uh, i will uh, also discuss the common paradoxes first and then i will try to explain it the fundamental rights paradoxes which have uh, arisen because of this pandemic let me start with legal pragmatism because it's a central point of our topic today first let me explain what is legal pragmatism many of you might be knowing it but uh, still i'd like to explain it in very simple terms i will not go into the details into the technical aspects of legal pragmatism because no one would like to hear this complex theories in the afternoon and especially on a very dark so i will try to explain legal pragmatism by common pragmatism i will apply pragmatism to explain legal pragmatism and i will take help of spiritual pragmatism and scientific pragmatism to explain legal pragmatism just as there are legal pragmatists there are also scientific pragmatists and spiritual pragmatists i consider swami vivekananda a greatest one of the greatest spiritual pragmatists and professor albert einstein one of the greatest scientific pragmatists uh, swami vivekananda could explain the complex vedantic philosophies by giving practical examples living examples he could relate everything the philosophies with the with the with the, with the life of the people and that is what made him a great spiritual pragmatist of course he had acquired this quality from his guru sri ramkrishna paramahansa uh sri ramkrishna paramahansa could explain the complicated philosophies as you all know with small simple parables and uh, it could be grasped by the common people and this made him one of the greatest spiritual pragmatists uh before meeting swami vekar uh, before meeting ramkrishna paramahansa swami vekananda would ask every each and every religious or spiritual person a particular question the question was the question would be in fact has the person seen god whenever the person would speak on complicated philosophies religious philosophies theories swami vekanand would put one simple question sir have you seen god and when the person would say that it is difficult to see god you cannot see god god cannot be seen then he would just terminate the discussion and say that i do not have any business with you if you have not seen god then it is useless to talk with you so when swami ji met for uh, met uh, ramkrishna paramahansa for the first time he put the same question to sri ramkrishna question was sir have you seen god and sri ram krishna paramahansa said yes i have seen god and i see him 10 times more clearly than i see all the things of this world including you 
this was the answer which was based on spiritual pragmatism and this answer impressed swami vivekananda and after that you all know how he became his disciple and the rest is all history so swami vivekananda could explain the complex vedantic philosophies with living examples he said that if god is there he must be seen god must become practical people must see god people must live god he said that the vedanta philosophy if it is true then people should live vedanta philosophy in their lives and this is what made him a great spiritual pragmatist just a short story to explain spiritual pragmatism before i come to legal pragmatism swami vivekananda was one visiting a uh, temple in varanasi and there he was chased by some monkeys as he was chased swami vivekananda started running away from the monkeys the more he ran more he was chased by the monkeys a sadhu was sitting there he saw all this thing happening and he said to swami ji swami ji please stop don't run away and you just face the monkeys swami ji turned around he stopped he turned around and faced the monkeys the moment he stopped and faced the monkeys the monkeys ran away later on when uh, while giving a lecture in america he said that he had learned a very important lesson from that uh, incident the lesson was that the more you run away from the problem the more the problems will chase you or the more you uh, try to escape from the problem the more you will be chased by the problem but if you stop analyze and face the problem boldly then the problem will run away so see swami vivekananda could have explained this philosophy that if you run away from problems problem will chase you by complicated theories and philosophies but he gave a very very simple example he related the things with the life of the people so that people could grasp it easily this is what made him a spiritual pragmatist uh legal pragmatism is diametrically opposed to the theory of analytical positivism you might have uh, i'm sure you have uh, heard about john austin and you have said about him also his theories it is diametrically opposed to the theory of austin legal pragmatism is diametrically opposed to the theory of austin legal pragmatism gives you the discretion the flexibility to deviate from the strict applications of the rules and principles keeping in mind the social reality that means if the social reality so demands you have to deviate from the strict rules and principles in most of in a uh, uh, few cases which have been decided recently supreme court has applied this principle of legal pragmatism in its decision i'm not going to the details of the decision but there have been uh, in many cases in fact in past also where the apex court has applied legal pragmatism in its decision legal pragmatists uh, believe that law in books and law in practice are two different things they say that if you want to understand what is factory law you have to go to the factory you have to work there for one month and then you will be in a better position to understand what is the law relating to factory they say that if you just study the factories act if you just study the books on factory law factory laws then you won't understand factory laws in the right perspective so you have to go to the factory you have to stay there work in that environment then you will understand what in reality are factory laws similarly they say that if you want to know CR, cpc or crpc civil procedure code or criminal procedure code you have to go into the courts you have to go into the court premises you have to practice there then only you will be in a better position to understand what is cpc or is crpc in the right perspective just by reading the cpc in books you won't be able to understand what is cpc in the right perspective so legal pragmatists believe that there is a close relationship between law and society law should not deviate far away from the society and if the law deviates far away from the society that law will not be acceptable to the society people will not accept that law people will not obey that law austin's theory says that law is the command of the sovereign that means it says that people obey law out of fear not out of love but the legal pragmatists say that people should obey law out of love love law should come so closer to the life of the people 
that people fall in love with the law. So they should follow law, obey law, not out of fear, but out of love. So that is why I said that the theory of legal pragmatism is completely different and diametrically opposed to the theory of Austin, which is also called a gunman theory. So that means a person is showing a gun that if you do not obey the law, then I'm going to kill you. But legal pragmatism says that you don't have to show gun. Make law, bring law so closer to the lives of the people that people will start loving the law and obey the law out of, uh, out of love and not out of fear. So uh, now coming to the spiritual pragmatism. I have explained this, uh, sorry, spiritual pragmatism I explained. Now coming to the scientific pragmatism. As I said, Professor Albert Einstein was one of the greatest scientific pragmatists. Just as I uh, mentioned a story about Swami Vivekananda, I'm just going to uh, mention a small story, a little bit, a uh, little story about uh, Einstein to explain legal pragmatism. Uh, once Professor Einstein was delivering a lecture and uh, in the audience there were uh, young people. He was delivering a lecture on the relativity of time. As you all know, this famous theory, theory of relativity. So he was explaining the theory with complicated theories and uh, theorems and formulas. So one young man sitting there, he said that, sir, I'm a layman. I do not know anything about physics. Can you explain to me in a very simple verse, what do you mean by relativity of time? He has said that time is relative. So can you explain without these complicated formulae, without these complicated theorems, theories, in a simple verse, what do you mean by relativity of time? How time is relative? Ross Einstein said, my dear friend, have you ever fallen in love? The young man he smiled, he felt a little bit shy and said that, yes, sir, I have fallen in love. Then Ross Einstein asked him, did you find any difference in the running of time when you were sitting with your girlfriend, talking with your girlfriend, and when you were waiting for your girlfriend? I repeat, the, uh, repeat it once again. He said, he asked the question, did you find any difference in the running of time when you were sitting with your girlfriend and talking with her and when you were waiting for your girlfriend? The man, he thought for a while and then said that, yes, sir, I found a difference. Then Ross Einstein asked him, what was the difference? He said that when I was waiting for my girlfriend, then every second appeared like an hour. The time, each, each and every second, Appeared like an hour. But when I was talking with my girlfriend, with, when I was with my girlfriend, then each and every hour appeared like a second. So, Professor Einstein said, This is what I mean by time being relative. So, this is what made him, uh, this is uh, how uh, Professor Einstein uh, could explain the complicated philosophies, the complicated theorems on physics with live examples, living examples, keeping in mind the social realities. Since the man was a young man, he gave him an example of love, of romance, so that he could better grasp it, uh, grasp the theory. So now coming to again, uh, again to, to the concept of legal pragmatism. Legal pragmatism in simple words means it is against the theory of occupational formalism. What is occupational formalism? Occupational formalism means too much adherence too much adherence to the strict rules and principles in disregard of social realities. In simple words, it means whatever be the situation, whatever be the social reality, you have to apply the law strictly, you have to apply the rules strictly. This is occupational formalism. But this sometimes leads to a lot of injustice. Occupational formalism is not a good thing uh, in all the situations. I'll give you an example. Suppose I am taking a class and I make a rule that anyone who comes to the class after 15 minutes of the commencement of the class will not be allowed in the class. Now, suppose I am taking the class, a boy, uh, a student, he uh, comes to the door, comes to the entrance and seeks my permission for coming to the class. 
Now, if I apply the theory of operation for this, what will I do? I will take out the log book. What is the rule? The rule says that if a student comes to the class 50 minutes after coming out of the class, he will not be allowed. Okay. So I will see whether he has come within 50 minutes or not. If he has not come within 50 minutes, I will say, see, friend, you are not allowed in the class because the rules say so. I will not ask him the reason for coming late. No questions for that. I will just say him that you are not allowed in the class because the rules say so. Now, if I do not apply opposition formalism, if I apply legal pragmatism, if I apply the principle of legal pragmatism, then I will ask the student the reason for coming to the class late. Suppose the student says that he was late because there was uh, a procession, a political procession on the road and there was no prior notice of the procession and so there was a traffic jam and so he was late for that reason. So there was no mistake on the part of the student. So if I do not allow him in the class for no fault of his, he was not at fault. If I do not allow him to enter the class, then it will lead to injustice. <laughs> injustice. That means if I apply the law strictly, then it will lead to injustice. But if I apply legal pragmatism, then it will uh, give it justice. So this is how legal pragmatism becomes helpful in certain cases and helps us to deliver justice. Legal pragmatism believes that there can be no legal reasoning without political reasoning, without keeping in mind the social reasoning or social realities. They say that if you make any decision without keeping in mind the social realities, then that decision will not be a good decision. So they say that law and politics are mixed together. You cannot separate law from politics or society. So law cannot be separated from the sociological uh, the social ideologies or the political ideologies. This is the view of the legal pragmatism. In the famous case of Nanavati versus State of Maharashtra, you might have studied this case in the took place in 1959, where Nanavati was a uh, legal, uh, so, sorry, he was a naval commander and uh, he had uh, killed uh, his uh, wife's lover in the heat of the moment. The defense had said that he had killed in the, in the heat of the moment, but the prosecution had said that it was a cold blooded murder. So as you all know, at that time the jury system was uh, there and the matter was referred to the jury. The jury had acquitted Nanavati. See, the decision of jury, in, in, in my view, was based on legal pragmatism because it kept in mind the social realities. There was a strong public opinion in favor of Nanavati. The public mood was to acquit. Nanavati, because he was a naval commander and they felt that he did the right thing by killing the person who was not doing the right thing by uh, seducing his wife. So they felt, people felt at that time that what Nanavati had done was the right thing and since he was a patriot, he was a great commander, he was a, uh, a, navy, a, good, a good navy officer, efficient navy officer and so they all supported him. So the jury, it made its decision not based on the formal laws. In my opinion, I think they had made the decision based on the legal pragmatism concept. The High Court it dismissed the ruling or the decision of the jury and it sent the case to the bench, to the High Court bench. High Court bench convicted Nanavati. Now see, again there was application of the doctrine of legal pragmatism. So it was not on the part of the judiciary, but it was on the part of the executive. You all know that the governor of Maharashtra at that time had acquitted Nanavati. She had pardoned Nanavati. Why? Because the public vote was in favor of Nanavati. In fact, at that time, the media had reported that if Nanavati is not pardoned, then the bomb, then Bombay, the city of Bombay will start burning. People will torch the buildings, the government offices, and uh, there will be a riot, there will be a mismanagement everywhere. In fact, there will be a, a disruption of law and order. So keeping in, mood, uh, keeping in mind the public mood, the social reality, 
the governor of that time applied legal pragmatism and pardoned none of it. That means if it was based on strict rules and laws, then perhaps Nanavati would have been in the jail for many, many years. But since legal pragmatism was applied, social reality was kept in mind, he was pardoned by the government. So this is a very good example where legal pragmatism was applied by executive and the jury, not by the judiciary. Now, how this concept of legal pragmatism is connected with our topic, with this COVID-19 pandemic. Now I'm coming to this. See, due to this COVID-19 pandemic, the factories are closed, the offices are closed, the schools and colleges are closed, people's fundamental right, like right to livelihood, right to privacy, in some cases, right to health, right to food, right to education have been affected. Now to deal with this situation, if we follow the traditional means, the traditional methods, then it will be very difficult to deal with the situation because it's a very different situation, it's a new situation. So we have to deviate from the existing social norms, from the legal norms to deal with the situation. In other words, we have to apply the concept of legal pragmatism. See, this happening of webinar, I'm uh, delivering uh, my presentation on online webinar. This webinar concept, see, is uh, in fact, uh, it is uh, happening everywhere throughout India. So this is a result of legal practice. We are experimenting with innovative methods to deal with the situation. Schools and colleges are closed, so teachers, they are taking online classes. Online classes have become the order of the day. In schools, uh, in fact, uh, my children, they are studying in Bangalore school. They have started online full classes from class uh, from 11 a.m. onwards. They are having their classes till uh, till 3 p.m. This is all happening online. So it's an application of pragmatist philosophy. Now, uh, in some cases, you might have seen on the media on the on, on the television, the policemen they have found some innovative methods to punish the wrongdoers, the people who have, who have uh, broken the lockdown. You might have seen people asking, uh, policemen asking the people to do sit-ups as a punishment for breaking the lockdown. In some cases, they have to come before the camera and have to say that they are the enemies of the society. Since they have broken the lockdown, they, have, they are the enemies of the society. They have to uh, say before this on the camera. So policemen see they are, they are trying to find out some innovative methods to deal with the situation and innovative punishments are being uh, awarded to the wrong force. So this is deviation. This is a deviation from the strict rules and principles. These kinds of punishments have not been mentioned anywhere in the law books, but these methods are being invented to deal with the situation. This is what I call application of legal practice. So legal practice, as I said, it gives you the flexibility, the discretion, to deviate from strict application of legal rules if the social uh, reality so demands, if the social societal situation so demands. This is how uh, this concept of legal pragmatism is relevant in this COVID-19 period. Now coming to another situation, see, a few cases, uh, there have been a report uh, in the media that a uh, few uh, prisoners have been infected with uh, COVID-19 in the jails. So now if the number increases, suppose 60-70% uh, people in the jail, in the prisons get infected with the COVID-19 virus, then what will happen? The government will be forced to uh, release them. We cannot keep them uh, inside the jail with uh, those infections. So if we go strictly by the jail manuals, if we go strictly by the former rules, then it will be very difficult to deal with the situation. So what will the government do? Government will deviate from the existing former rules, the jail manuals, to deal with the situation. Releasing the prisoners due to infection is not given anywhere in the jail manual. But to deal with the situation, they have to invent these things. To deal with the this is what I call legal practice, and it has to be applied to deal with the situation, otherwise existing rules 
strict uh, adherence to the uh, uh, existing formal rules will not be able to deal with the situation. Another example, see the schools and colleges are closed. In fact, uh, uh, we are also uh, not being able to take classes. Exams have been postponed. In some cases, the students have lost a full semester. Now, how is the government or UGC going to compensate these students who have lost a semester, who have lost the classes? See, government, again, they have to apply legal pragmatism. They have to, uh, maybe they have to pass the students without conducting any, any examination. Or maybe they will pass the students based on the marks of previous semester. Or maybe they will conduct some online uh, objective classes and they will pass them. So these things are not given anywhere in the rules. But to deal with the situation, the administration, the universities, the government, UDC will have to take these measures. This is what I call legal practice. Uh, so in every aspect of national life, in every aspect of uh, legal life or in every legal aspects, this legal pragmatism has to be has to be applied to deal with the situation. In the coming future, in the coming years, you will see a lot of application of legal pragmatism because the existing rules and laws will not be enough to deal with the situation, to deal with this new difficult situation. So we'll see a lot of legal pragmatism in every aspect coming into play in the near future. Now, coming to the paradoxes. Before I come to the fundamental rights paradox, I will try to explain some general paradox, some common paradoxes which have been created by COVID-19 uh, crisis. First paradox, you all know about paradox. I'm not going to explain paradox. Uh, you all, uh, I'm sure you, are, you all are familiar with the word paradox. First paradox is the paradox of social isolation. Social isolation is necessary and vital for slowing down the spread of COVID-19 virus. But it is an absolute antithesis of everything else. Social isolation makes anxiety worse. It manifests the latent fear in greater degree. It increases our insecurity. It makes every fault line bigger and wider. So see, social isolation prevents us from the infection. But on the other hand, it exposes us to other dangers and risks. Risks like mental depression, insecurity, anxiety. Coming to the second paradox, paradox of privilege and non privilege The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the divide between the privileged and the not privileged. It has exposed the divide between have and have nots. We feel that people who are privileged, who have uh, stopped essential supplies in their homes, are feeling comfortable and uh, they are very happy in their homes. But this is not the case. This COVID-19 crisis has made every people, everybody across the board, regardless of privilege, very vulnerable. I'll give you an example. There are some reports which have said that the privileged class who have stopped essential supplies in their homes, they have everything to deal with the situation. They are also feeling depressed. Why? Because they are suffering from a guilt feeling. When they see people on the television, the policemen, the doctors, helping the poor people, helping the needy people, uh, risking their lives, they feel that they are not doing enough. And therefore, they suffer from a guilt feeling. And when this guilt feeling happens every day, because every day they are seeing TV, meet, uh, the media reports are coming in. When they see this, they feel depressed. Their self-esteem uh, is some, somewhere, uh, their self-esteem somewhere gets dampened and their conscience is hit. And when this happens every day, it takes a toll on their mental health and on their physical health. So this is a paradox. Even the privileged class, we feel that privileged class, they are in fact uh, have happy in this uh, corona crisis period. In fact, uh, only the non-privileged class are suffering. It's not the case. The privileged class are also suffering. In fact, perhaps suffering more mentally due to this health feeling. So this is a paradox. The third paradox, testing those who should not be tested. What I mean by this? The strength of COVID-19 virus lies in the fact that it hides better than other viruses. In some cases, uh, 
the persons who are infected, they do not show any symptom. They are asymptomatic. Now, these people who do not show any symptom, they are the people who spread the virus in a silent way. Since they do not show any symptom, people believe that they are uh, not suffering from any uh, infection. These people mix with the family members and they silently spread the virus to the other people. So we need to test those people who do not show any symptom. In other words, we need to test those people whom normally we would not have tested. So this is a paradox. Testing those people who should not be tested or whom we should not have tested. So this is the paradox of, so this is the third paradox. Fourth paradox, staying indoors to prevent the virus. We have been asked to stay indoors in our homes and not to go outside because uh, or, or, or it will uh, spread the virus. Now, some experts have said that in indoors, it is the homes where virus is spreading more. And this is the paradox. We are being directed to stay in our homes and in our homes, the virus is spreading more. Let me explain this a little bit. According to US Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the virus spreads from one person to another person when they are standing within a distance of six feet from each other. When a person coughs or sneezes, the, the droplets, the, the droplets they spread from one person to the other, the respiratory droplets. Now, if these persons are outside, suppose they are outside their home, then this expert said that the breeze which will might be blowing will disperse these droplets and the chances of chance of infection will be less. But when they are inside the home, when they are indoors, then there'll be no wind and there'll be more likely, uh, there will be more chances of, of spreading the infection from one person to another person. And especially so when the person is asymptomatic, when he does not show any uh, symptom. In that case, staying at home and mixing with the family members will make the family members more vulnerable to this virus. So they say that experts, I'm not saying this, the experts are saying that you can go outside. The secret lies not in staying indoors to prevent the virus. The secret lies in going outside, going in the fresh air, but not mixing with the people. You should not form groups. You can go outside, you can go in the park, you can play, play, play there, but do not form groups. Do not form groups of three or four people. Maintain a social distance. So this is the paradox. We, are, we have been asked to stay indoors, but indoors is the place where the virus has more chances of spreading. Uh, during the SARS epidemic, which happened a few years back, the report said that people who stayed inside without any proper ventilation, they were more vulnerable. In fact, uh, they suffered more because of the SARS virus. And in fact, people who had uh, good access to ventilation, those who had gone outside, in fact, they suffered less. They suffered and there was, in fact, the infection was less. So, uh, we have to keep in mind this also. We can go outside, experts are saying, we can go outside, but we should not form groups, we should maintain social distance. So staying at home 24 hours, that is also not recommended according to some experts. Next paradox, man is having difficulty breathing, but the planet Earth is breathing better. COVID-19 pandemic has closed all the factories, has closed all the, uh, in fact, now, now the transport uh, has started, but uh, last uh, two or three months, we all know that all the transport uh, they were closed, trains, including trains, aeroplanes, buses, etc., etc. So, uh, since the factories are closed, there is no smoke from the chimneys coming out. There is no uh, less smoke from the exhaust of the vehicles. So, this has made the planet Earth a better place. The planet is now breathing freely. In fact, we are having breathing problems, but the planet Earth is now breathing freely. In fact, also the planet Earth is feeling quieter because many transports are since the transports are closed, so there is less noise from the from the vehicles, and so the Earth is also feeling quieter. So this is a paradox. On one hand, we are suffering, but on the other hand, the Mother Earth uh, is uh, feeling better. So it's, it's a paradox, positives in negatives, it's a paradox. Next paradox, before I come to the fundamental rights paradox, 
increase in domestic violence. We have been asked to stay indoors, and we feel that if we are indoors, we are if we are in the safety of our homes, we'll be uh, in a very good position. We'll be comfortable. But this is not always the case. Home is not always a safe place for everyone. Think about those people who are living in an abusive relationship. Those children who are living in an abusive family, wife or husband who is living in an abusive environment. For them, the home is now a hell. Since they have been asked to stay at home, so they are suffering more. They are suffering more from this domestic violence. In fact, there are some reports which have said that in this COVID-19 period, in many countries, the domestic violence, the domestic homicides have increased. In fact, the people who live in abusive relationship are suffering a lot because of this uh, COVID-19 crisis and because they have to stay indoors. So this is another paradox. We have been asked to stay indoors, but indoors is the place where people are exposed to greater risk, especially people who are living in an abusive relationship. See, I'm not opposing the lockdown. Lockdown is very necessary for preventing the spread of the virus. What I'm trying to say that these are the unfortunate and troubling paradoxes of social distancing, which have been created by this COVID-19. These are unfortunate paradoxes. We are not supporting this kind of paradox, but these are, these are unfortunate paradoxes and unintended paradoxes, which have been created by COVID-19. Little bit of legal perspective before I come to uh, because uh, uh, many students are uh, listening uh, to me, so I'd like to give them a little bit of legal perspective also, so uh, it will help you in your uh, academic life later on. See, this lockdown was enforced under which law? It was enforced under Section Six, under Section Six of the Disaster Management Act, 2005. Under Section Six of the Disaster Management Act, 2005. This lockdown was closed. Section 2D of the Disaster Management Act defines disaster. I'll just read out very quickly the disaster meaning. Disaster means a catastrophe, mishap, calamity, a grave occurrence in any area arising from natural or man made causes or by accident or negligence, which results in substantial loss of life or human suffering or damage to and destruction of property or damage to degradation of environment and is of such a nature or magnitude to be beyond the coping capacity of the community of the affected area. This is how Disaster Management Act 2005 defines the word disaster. Now, this section is not meant to deal with epidemics or diseases of any kind, but the Ministry of Home Affairs declared the spread of COVID-19 as a notified disaster. Why? Why did they uh, declare it as a notified disaster? So that the state governments could use the part of state disaster response fund for uh, fighting this virus. So for this purpose, this uh, uh, COVID-19 was declared as a notified disaster so that the state governments can utilize the fund for fighting the COVID-19 virus. It is surprising to note that the word lockdown has not been defined anywhere. You won't find the definition of a lockdown anywhere. So a question may be asked that if lockdown is nowhere defined, then how can it be used to restrict the fundamental right of movement under Article 191D? Well, it can be done, as you all know, because the freedom of movement is subject to reasonable restriction under Article 192. So that can be done, but there is no problem with that. Now, what's the role of Epidemic Diseases Act 1897? Epidemic Diseases Act. This act has also been applied during this period. Section 2 and 2A. Section 2 and 2A of Epidemic Diseases Act 1897 gives the government, the state government and the central government, the power to make necessary steps to fight this kind of epidemics or pandemic. Even if the steps are not mentioned anywhere in the legal books or in the legal practice. Still, government can take those steps, even if it is not mentioned in any legal practice or any legal theories. Under Section 6 of the Disaster Management Act, as I said, the lockdown was imposed. And under Section 10, the government is issuing a lot of guidelines you might be seeing in the media. Now, under which section these guidelines are issued? 
these guidelines are issued under section 10 of the epidemic sorry of the disaster management act okay so under this uh, act in the initial stages uh, there was a ban on all kind of transport services all uh, ser services were closed except the essential services like uh, the banks the telecommunication etc they were allowed to remain open otherwise most of the institutions including schools and colleges were closed under those guidelines the guidelines also provided that anybody violating the lockdown would be punished under what under which sections the punishment is provided for breaking the lockdown under section 51 to 60 of the disaster management act so uh, whenever a person breaks the lockdown he is being punished under section 51 to 60 of the disaster management act and also under section 188 of the indian penal code so under these two sections uh, section 51 to 60 of disaster management act and under section 188 of the IPC, Indian Penal Code, punishments are being provided to the people for breaking the lockdown. Section 188, it gives power to punish for disobedience of the orders promulgated by the public servant. Okay, so this is the legal perspective. Now coming to the fundamental right paradox, which is, which is also a central theme of our, of our discussion of this topic. The COVID-19 pandemic is spreading like a wildfire, uh, including India, it's now spreading very fast. The lockdown imposed to prevent the spread of virus is the need of the hour, you know, but it's also having adverse effects on the lives of the people. In fact, four or five fundamental rights of the people have been violated because of this COVID-19 crisis. In fact, this is probably the first time that an infectious disease is testing itself in the constitutional waters. As you all know, constitution provides us certain fundamental rights. Some rights have been granted in the part three, while some rights have been incorporated by the Supreme Court in Article 21, which deals with right to life. For example, right to health, right to food, this have been included under right to life. Now this COVID-19 pandemic poses challenge and test every day is posing challenge every day to the executive and the judiciary what's the challenge of the executive the challenge is to enforce the law of the land and to guarantee the fundamental rights as mentioned in part three and for judiciary what the challenge the challenge is to uphold the fundamental rights those fundamental rights which have been deprived by the or which have been denied by the state when the covid 19 crisis started the public discussion was shaped on three major rights, fundamental rights, right to life and livelihood, right to health and right to food. Let me take it one, uh, one by one, these fundamental rights and the paradox. Some state governments have made provisions uh, for payment of unemployment wages uh, to the migrant workers who have been deprived of their jobs. Some state governments in an attempt to guarantee right to health have converted the government hospital into COVID-19 hospitals the government, both central government, state governments have made a provision to ensure that there is availability of food stock in the ration shops. Despite these efforts, the states still struggle to provide and enforce the fundamental rights guaranteed by the constitution. Coming to right to food, recent reports have shown that those migrant workers who were stuck up during the uh, coronavirus uh, during the crisis, they struggled to get food and shelter. The public distribution, uh, distribution system, the PDF, which is called PDF, it suffers from implementation failure. There are a lot of uh, reports which say that the PDF system has failed in some cases. Thereby, the ruling of Supreme Court in PUCL versus Union of India which guaranteed right to food is being violated. In Delhi, according to some reports, one third ration shops were closed, citing non-availability of food. And there were many migrant workers in Delhi who did not have BPL card because they did not have a permanent address. So they could not avail the benefit of PDS. Seven lakh household could not avail the benefit of PDS system because their application for ration cards were pending in the, in the government office. Office. So this happened in many uh, states. So this is how the right to food, which was declared a fundamental right by Supreme Court, 
got violated and still is still being violated in many cases during this period coming to right to health right to health is a fundamental right under article 21 at present it appears that there is shortage of adequate testing kits in fact as in india also as the infection will uh, increase there'll be a shortage of testing kits if government does not take any drastic step in this regard we might feel a shortage in the coming future so uh, in some countries the situation is worse for the health uh, workers the non health workers this raises the question who will protect our protectors those who are protecting us who will protect them so their right to health which is a fundamental right is getting violated because there is no there's not enough adequate ppes personal protective equipments for the doctors and nurses in italy around 101 doctors and 30 medical staffs numbers has increased now uh, this was a report which was uh, 15 days back so it has increased at that time it said that 101 doctors and 30 medical staffs died due to unavailability of personal protective equipments and in, in india also as the rate increases infection rate will increase india might also face this kind of problems the health workers in india might also face this kind of problems if some drastic step is not taken by the government in india perspective the supreme court in the landmark judgment of consumer education and research center cerc versus union of india i will just read out what supreme court said supreme court in this case said the compelling necessity the compelling necessity to work in an industry exposed to health hazards due to indigence to breadwinning for himself and his dependents should not be at the cost of health and vigor of the healthcare workers a very very important uh, ruling of the supreme court in consumer education and research center versus union of india thus fundamental right to health of the healthcare workers was established by this ruling of the supreme court now this covid 19 crisis because of this covid 19 crisis the healthcare workers can be brought under this under the ambit of this judgment of the supreme court and the lack of personal protective equipment violates the fundamental right of health of the doctors and the nurses so in this in this way the uh, right to health is being violated because of this covid 19 virus right to education another very important fundamental right article 21a of the constitution makes right to free and compulsory education a fundamental right before uh, incorporation of article 21a in the supreme court in some cases had held that right to education is a fundamental right under article 21 for example in mohini jain versus state of karnataka popularly known as the capitation fee case it supreme court said that right to education is a fundamental right under now we have right to free and compulsory education now see since the schools are closed the government schools are closed and there's no provision in the right to education act 2009 to make up for the loss in fact under section 16 of right to education act 2009 it is said that no child admitted in any government school shall be held or expelled till the completion of the elementary education now what will happen because of this covid 19 crisis the government will have no other option but to pass the or promote the children to the next class so children they will be promoted no problem with that but since they have not received the fundamental education in that class so their fundamentals will become weak and later on when they sit for the competitive exam they will suffer so this is how their right to education will also be violated coming to mid term meals the suspension of the mid term we know that now the mid term meals have been suspended because uh, those meals or those uh, uh, the food has been directed to fight the covid 19 crisis it has been diverted to some other uh, areas now this suspension of mid term meals also affects in an indirect way right to education since we all know that this uh, mid term meals it uh, act, acted as a it in fact induced the family members to send their children to the schools now since the mid term meals have been closed and perhaps uh, after the lockdown period is relaxed or lockdown period is over uh, in my view uh, this might be uh, the bit the meals might the, the ban on bit uh, on the ban uh, the bit the, the suspension of the suspension of bit the meals might be extended it might be prolonged 
to meet the crisis so indirectly it will affect right to education of the children right to privacy right to privacy in kp putta swami you all know ks sorry ks putta swami ks putta swami versus team of india at the court held that right to privacy is a fundamental right under article 21 of the constitution there have been some reports is is not confirmed but there have been some reports where in the garb of covid 19 tracking the personal information has been shared and has been leaked in fact uh, there are some uh, allegations controversy regarding the arog situ also uh, we are not uh, sure about the reports whether it was genuine or not but if the informations have got leaked then it will be a very serious issue it should be considered a very serious issue because right to privacy is a fundamental right so government should take steps to instill faith in the minds of the people this arog situ app by tracking their movement the government is trying to tell them out they are not trying to violate their right to privacy rather they are trying to help them fight this covid-19 virus and this faith has to be instilled by the government in the minds of the people otherwise people the administrators will be created and this arog situ perhaps will not be very very successful so government has to take the step of instilling faith and trust in the mind of the people and if the informations are getting leaked then the government has to take steps so that the right to privacy is not violated and if need be the judiciary has also to step in to see that the right to privacy of the individuals is not being violated in the garb of tracking or uh, fighting the corona virus now the paradox paradox of the fundamental rights right to livelihood is a fundamental right in olga telecom versus bombay mutual corporation ai 96 1986 popularly known as the uh, payment welfare scheme a five judge bench of the supreme court said that right to livelihood is a fundamental right under article 21 the supreme court said i'll just read it out because it's very important it said an equally important facet of right to life is the right to livelihood because no person can live without the means of livelihood if the right to livelihood is not treated as part of the constitutional right to life the easiest way of depriving a person of his right to life would be to deprive him of his livelihood in view of the fact that article 39a and article 41 require the states to secure to citizen an adequate means of livelihood and right to work it would be sheer pedantry to exclude right to livelihood from the content of right to life so by this ruling right to livelihood was made a fundamental right under right to life now this due to this covid 19 pandemic as you all know uh, in uh, many countries including india the factories are closed the industries are closed the offices are closed and many people they have lost their jobs and hence they have lost their livelihoods in south asian countries almost 90% of the workforce is made up of self employed casual labor on daily basis and informal workers who do not have any social protection these lockdowns have deprived millions of people their jobs and their livelihoods so they might survive infection from coronavirus but if things are steps are not taken they will certainly die of of hunger since they do not have any money because they have not have they, they do not have their livelihood now see here is like the paradox on one hand the government has to enforce right to life because it is a fundamental right and right to right to life the government has to prepare the state has to prevent the spread of corona virus and has to protect the right of people right to life of the people from the virus so for protecting the right to life of the people to protect the people from this corona virus government has imposed lockdown so that the virus does not spread people do not get infected and so they do not die so for this purpose they have imposed a lockdown now due to this lockdown people have lost their jobs government by imposing lockdowns has protected right to life but on other hand by imposing lockdowns and depriving billions of people their livelihoods has deprived people of another very important fundamental right right to life so there has been a conflict between these two fundamental rights and this is a paradox 
status of livelihood, right to livelihood. Now, how to deal with this situation? It reminds me of the situation which arose few years back in a case where the Supreme Court had to balance two fundamental rights, right to life of the forest dwellers and right to environment. As we all know, right to environment is a fundamental right and right to life is also a fundamental right. Now, for the forest dwellers, cutting of the trees was, necess was a necessity because they depended on the, they depend on the, on the forest produce. So they have, they have to cut the trees. Now, cutting the trees amounts to degradation of the environment. So on one hand, from protecting their right to life, they have to cut the trees. And by cutting the trees, they are depriving right to environment of the other people. So here, Supreme Court had to make a balance between these two fundamental rights, these two opposing rights, these two uh, conflicting fundamental rights. And the same situation now, Supreme Court has to deal, the judiciary has to deal, the government has to deal. If cases come up in the Supreme Court, in the High Court, where there will be a conflict of these two fundamental rights, right to life and right to livelihood. From the news and media reports, you, you might have seen the migrant workers a few days back, uh, how they are returning from uh, their place of work. Recently, government has, of course, taken steps to send them to their respective uh, homes, to their native places. But a uh, few months, a uh, few days back, we saw how these people uh, uh, used all kinds of illegal means to travel and reach their native places. They could be seen traveling in the milk containers, in the cement mixer containers. Uh, around 14 or 80 people, uh, they, got, uh, they in fact, got run over by train while they were sitting on the tracks. They were uh, traveling and when they got tired, they sat on the rail tracks and they uh, uh, fell asleep and then they were run over by the, by the, by the train. So uh, see, what, why this happened? Because they were deprived of their livelihoods and so they wanted to return to their homes. So indirectly, the result of this, uh, the uh, result of uh, the death of these people was due to the lockdown and which, but, but, but as we know, lockdown was also a necessity and it's a necessity. So how to reconcile these things? In fact, uh, some media reports also uh, uh, showed how uh, 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 um, a woman was carrying a child in her hand and was traveling from a far off place uh, to, to her native uh, from far off uh, place to her native place, carrying uh, the little child in her arms. In fact, uh, she has said that she had traveled 100 uh, kilometers around uh, by foot to reach her place. Uh, we also saw how a girl uh, cycled so many kilometers uh, with her father, with her. Uh, father was suffering from some health problems. She cycled so many kilometers to reach to her destination place. So many people have died out of exhaustion while traveling. Some people who are caught while traveling, uh, they are sent to the quarantine centers. So they hang in, uh, hang in between their native place and their work of uh, their working place. So their uh, condition becomes worsened. So uh, this is a problem which uh, people are facing due to this law and these are unfortunate happenings. So the point which I'm trying to drive home is that lockdown is saving the lives of the people in one way, but it is taking the lives of the poor people, migrant workers, unemployed people on the other hand. And this is a glaring paradox of COVID-19. Well, it may be argued that right to livelihood can be curbed, can be restricted by imposing reasonable restriction in the interest of general people. Now, my question will be, who are the general people? Are the privileged class the general people? Or these people, poor people, general people? If these poor people are considered as general people, then imposing a reasonable restriction on right to livelihood in the interest of general people becomes meaningless. This argument fails. So we have to think about this, that the government has to think about it and find out some solution to deal with this unfortunate paradox. Uh, now, before I uh, end, uh, just uh, I'll take just two or three minutes. Now, see, uh, according to Sri Aurobindo, behind every event that is, happening, uh, that, it, that is happening in this world, there are two forces at play. One is the dharmic forces, other is the asuric forces. The dharmic forces, they bring peace, 
they uh, bring uh, peace, they bring calmness in the people, and they go good to the men. But the Asuric forces, they bring destruction, they bring disharmony, they create tension in the environment. Now, this from the medical angle, this COVID-19 infection is just like any other disease, like a heart disease, like AIDS, cancer. But just observe what it brings with it. It brings with it mistrust. It creates a mistrust. It creates a fear psychosis. It creates a suspicion in the minds of the people. It destroys peace. So these are the asteroid forces according to the philosophy of Aravindo, Sri Aravindo. The philosophy of lost karma has been uh, used to explain this current pandemic. Lost karma, in simple word, means as you sow, so you will see. In scientific term, it means every action has equal and opposite reaction. Every action has equal and opposite action. Man has crossed his limit of interfering with the nature, the unmindful deforestation, pollution, the uh, accumulation of nuclear weapons. Manaj, we have interfered so much with the nature, with the Mother Earth, that a backlash was inevitable. There are some reports which say that the coronavirus was created in the Wuhan lab. If this is true, then this would be considered as an extreme interference with the, with the nature. If we create stress on the nature, then the nature will create stress on us. If we impose stress and tension on the nature, the nature will impose stress and tension on it. This is law of karma. This is what is called every action has equal and opposite reaction. We used to put animals in cages. Still, we put animals in cages in, in the juice. So now, Mother Earth, nature has put us in cages in our homes in form of this uh, lockdown. When person does any wrong, we put that person in jail. We confine the person in a jail. We have done, we have committed so many wrongs against the Mother Earth. So now Mother Earth has confined us in our homes. In other words, it has put us in a kind of jail. So see, when we fall in any adverse situation and question of survival comes up, we take some emergency or unprecedented steps. Why? So that we can survive. The Mother Earth is taking those steps for her survival. We have exploited and polluted it so much that now the Earth, in order to survive, is taking these drastic steps, taking these steps of, uh, of this pandemic to lock us in our homes so that the factories are closed, so that there's no pollution from the factories, from the from the exhaust of the vehicles, so that it can clean itself. The earth is trying to survive, and for this, it is taking these uh, drastic steps. As per the philosophy of law, in fact, some reports say that what government programs with a budget of twenty thousand crores could not achieve, nature has done on its own. Now, the Ganga water, the river waters, uh, the quality of river waters has improved so much. In fact, the biodiversity is reviving. We have created so much disobedience in the nature and the ecosystem that the nature was forced to take this extreme step. This is nature's way of bouncing back, reclaiming its lost territory. It's like tit for tat. What you have done to me, I'm going to do the same thing to you. Thank you so much, sir, for enlightening us so delightfully on today's topic. Before we end this session, I would request our TIC madam to give vote of thanks. Before presenting the vote of thanks, I must challenge that today's session uh, increases our, our inquisitiveness to attend such webinar and increases our zeal to organize such webinar in future in a lot of numbers. And uh, I must uh, extend my heartful gratitude to Professor Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Kibari not only to be the resource person in our webinar, webinar uh, but also for uh, guiding me in settling down the schedule and in settling down the topic also. So thank you, sir, on part you. of my uh, authority, college authority, uh, my colleagues, and uh, the students of 
yes uh, really the session is too much informative and too much practical to understand the present situation i thank all the academicians and scholars from the state out of state and from all over the country to join this platform and enriching the platform by sharing their uh, auspicious views i must thank to all the students uh, because without their uh, joining no academic platform will become a successful one so thank you students thank you very much for joining okay. the session thank, thank you so much thank you sir i thank you that we will have you another time and in future for yes sure, sure. Yeah. thank you sure. Thank you everybody thank you to all thank you so much bye bye, bye, -bye.